Okay, so thank you, Georgia. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's it's really uh, exciting to be to be here because uh, we all we really really wanted this meeting, this mostly informal meeting, in which we will try to follow up a little bit on what happened in uh, last November at the economy of Francesco. If you remember, we, we uh, had a very interesting meeting, a workshop uh, in November in which we tried to put together different views about work and care and especially to, uh, to let Professor Nadeski to show, um, to outline uh, her proposal. And we also had our friends and partner of GI Group there to discuss this, uh, this proposal. Well, today we are here basically to try and, and move on, I would say, to try and work together on those first ideas in a mostly informal setting. So please feel uh, <laughs> relaxed, all of you, because really we want this to be uh, mostly uh, really a, a, a working time in which uh, all of us can share uh, views and ideas to, to try to, uh, to do what we can to provide a little bit uh, advances in in a, in a new different idea idea of how uh, working care can can uh, can stand together in a in a new economy. So I don't want to to spend um, to waste more time. So really, um, I'm happy to have you all here. Thank you very much for participating. Now I will leave the floor to Georgia that will introduce a little bit of uh, basic uh, rules of the game for for today, and then we will open the floor to our our speakers and to all the people that had to uh, to say something to day. So thank you very much and enjoy this afternoon or morning in, in Canada. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, okay, thank you, first of all, for being here, because I know it was everyone made time and I also messed up the whole daylight saving legal timing. So, <laughs> so that was my fault. So how this is going to work, we just want to have, okay, obviously the, the main introduction by Professor Nadelsky, which we've all prepared on, on the material. And then we want to get into actual real life examples. So we'll have Michael do that. And then um, engineer Baroni, which we will call Francesco because it's, it's in line with the economy of Francesco. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he will explain a little bit on one side his personal experience and on one side the the data that we have for Europe because we're gonna analyze that. And then Rita works in the same field, so she works for a multinational that tries to introduce volunteering. So we'll go into that. Every every other person that is not in the panel, please feel free to add comments in the chat, and we will and we will attend to them. Just don't intervene directly because we want to try to keep it ongoing for now. Thank you. So, Professor. Okay. So, um, can I assume that most of you have have heard the outline of this proposal before? Yes. Okay. So. Um, so let me just highlight a few things that I think are important to bear in mind. One is that I'm talking about norms, not state enforced law, even though there will be some legal supports necessary. And we should never underestimate the power of norms since uh, it is norms that extract the millions of hours of unpaid care from women all over the world. The other thing is that, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of writing out there about how unfair it is that women have to do all the care and that the burdens of care should be more equally distributed, which of course I agree with, but the emphasis of our project is the benefits of care. And that those benefits and what one learns from care have to be shared by all. And the most important benefit is to understand the relationship between care and relationships and how both care and relationships are really foundational to human well-being. Uh, and one other little note that has risen from my discussion with some disability scholars is uh, when, when we say that everyone should do 22 hours of care, what we mean by that is a guideline. It depends, of course, on your capabilities, but it's a guideline to tell everybody, especially in the transition, uh, what they should be aiming for as an understanding of 
their responsibility as a mature adult. So I say a mature adult, but another point I want to highlight is that I think that um, this move to uh, part-time for all will help us all think more creatively about how everyone contributes to care. So from children to the elderly, who often feel like they're no longer productive members of society, but um, even if they're not doing paid work, they're quite competent to do a whole range of care, but they're not invited to do it. I increasingly in um, modern industrialized societies where the elderly are often some uh, care home only with other older people. Um, and one other point I've noticed uh, as I give workshops on this, that some people feel concerned about uh, the idea that what people will do their work in communities of care, right? That when you're, the immediate demands of friends and family are low, then you're maintaining this 22 hour obligation, but in communities of care. And people have expressed a variety of anxieties about that, whether some of the hierarchies that exist in our world might be replicated in those care communities. But actually, I think that they're central to the idea that we all come to recognize ourselves as people in need of care, and people who provide care. And that alone, that self-identification shift should do a lot of work towards undermining the denigration of care, which is at the root of so many problems. But I do wanna emphasize that we don't imagine that these communities of care could replace professional, all forms of professional care. And although we think the demand for formal care for children um, daycare, as we call it in North America, and, and for the elderly will be reduced when the amount of unpaid care available is vastly increased. It won't go away. There will continue to be a need for well-funded, publicly supported um, child care, elder care, care for people with disabilities. Um, and the other thing I want to emphasize is that we think that community, I'm really happy to hear about uh, from the other participants here, we think community participation is a really important part of what we think will emerge from a new world where everybody has more time. But we want to insist that community participation is a distinct form of contribution from care. And so even if you're doing something really important, like, uh, you know, advocating for saving the water or for better daycare, for that matter, that kind of advocacy is not a reason to come home and expect somebody else to have cooked your dinner and done the shopping and cleaned the house and care for your children. So it's, it's not a replacement of the care obligation that everybody has. Of course, it can be seen as a form of care, but it's a different form of care and the one does not replace the other. So now I just, I wanna say a, a word or two about what I'm hoping the pandemic has taught us. Um, so I, on the one hand, everybody is conscious of the fact that the pandemic has highlighted our awareness of the importance of care and of the deep failures of care that exist. So most dramatically uh, care for the elderly that the, all across the world, we see this highlighted. Um, but I, I'm sorry to say that when I hear commenting on it, I hear much less on the link between care and work. And I think that is something that women during the pandemic have become extremely conscious of, which is you cannot do your work unless somebody is doing the care that is necessary. And women who are at home trying to do their work and care for their children, we see really dramatically that when schools and childcare close down, everyone, people who had not paid attention to this before, notice that work relies on somebody else doing the care. So now I think what we need to ask ourselves is what happens to care when the demands of the workplace ignore the need for care? That is when the workplace is structured in ways that just pay no attention to the background need for care. And it's really important because what one hears about over and over again is we need to get back 
to people back to work, back to work as we know it. But that is not gonna solve the problem that has been illuminated by the pandemic. Work relies on care, but care is becoming unsustainable because of the structure of work and the ongoing denigration of care. As long as employers are still looking for the ideal employee, which is somebody who puts work first, whose priority is always work, um, there is going to be a question of who's going to do that care. Right now, we have a situation, and even before the pandemic, when women who are increasingly in the paid labor force are doing both. They come home from a full day of work and they do care. We also see increasingly all over the world in countries that never used to do this um, at the mid and lower level of the economy, people are hiring uh, very low paid people, very often immigrants from elsewhere to do care work in the home. Which, and this practice reinforces, I think, the denigration of care. And we have good evidence that while in heterosexual couples, men are helping a little bit more, it's nowhere near 50%. Uh, one estimate was if we continued on the current worldwide trajectory of increased participation by men, it would take us 200 years to get to parity. But just advocating for women's right to equal access to good jobs and advocating that men take up their responsibilities of 50% care isn't enough because if you don't change the workplace, that advocacy has to fail. Women will not be able to meet this model of the ideal worker and men will not be able to take up 50% of the care, neither rich men nor poor men will have the time to do that unless the structure of work changes. So um, I'm not gonna go into the detail. I hope we'll have a chance to talk about this more. Of course, the whole point of this is that the structure of work has to change. What we want is good part-time jobs for everyone. What this means is that existing jobs have to be deconstructed. You know, most jobs have eight or 10 components. They need to be disaggregated so that we can create multiple jobs. Or if they really need to be under one umbrella, shared jobs, we just have to become much more creative about how we construct our jobs. And of course, to stop treating paid work as inherently more important than care. And that is a huge value shift that we hope everybody participating in care will promote. Um, I do, I hope you've all heard it before, but I want to remind you that this whole distinction between work and care, which I keep repeating over and over again, is an arbitrary one that I need in order to diagnose the problems out there and to propose a solution, but it is deeply arbitrary. Good care takes work and good work is caring work has care built into the structure of it. So I need to bear that in mind as I continue to work with these categories because that's what we've got. One more thing that I'm hoping maybe we'll have some further participation from is this proposal will not work even in rich countries unless there is better provision of economic security for all. Now that can take place in many different ways and our book does not propose a single model. One way is basic income. Another way is a much greater level of social services for everyone. So uh, healthcare, education, transportation, housing, all of these have forms of public support so that um, they are either free or much more affordable than they currently are. And Actually, my co-author Tom Mallison is trying to is working on a paper that weighs those two. Where, where should you put your political energy behind basic income or behind a big increase in the provision of social services? He, he is he thinks he's going to come out on the social services side. Um, a living wage is something that we do think is required for this, and that could happen uh, right away, almost everywhere. Um, we define a living wage as a wage that one person could support herself and a child on 30 hours a week. 
that's a living wage. And it's important to remember that that's not a very different calculus than the old post-war living wage, which existed for about 30 to 50 years and capitalism did just fine under. And that model was a man should be able to support himself and his family. It was a highly gendered notion um, on 40 hours a week. And that, that, was, that worked perfectly well. So um, to conclude, we, we think that this new model, part-time for all, will solve, first of all, this deep underlying problem of the denigration of care, primarily through the fact that everybody does it. And everybody recognizes, as they do not all now recognize, that they require it and they receive it from others. But more specifically, it will challenge the deep inequality that is embedded in how care is structured. And it's important to remember here that today, it's really increasingly clear that this is not just a gender equality problem. Gender equality is there everywhere across the world around care, but more and more other categories of hierarchy, race, class, immigration status are used to figure out who is at the bottom and who and those at the bottom should do the care. And so this transformation of care should challenge that all of those hierarchies which are built into uh, the system of care. And I think it, this is really important to emphasize because even people who are not very interested in care and not very interested in gender, but they do think they're interested in equality, have to come to see that if you build your society around a system of care that relies on a structure of inequality, you will never get an equal society. And I think that's really important because there, you know, there are thousands of scholars and policymakers worried about equality who never turn their minds to care. Uh, the other one other problem is family stress. Um, we think this will make a huge difference in the uh, increasing levels of, of stress that are noticed also in the workplace. And I think, you know, are skyrocketing, at least in North America, numbers of mental health issues is surely also related to this increasing stress between work and uh, family life. And then the last one, which you will have heard before, but I think is the most important because it's the one least talked about, and that is the care policy divide. That if we continue to organize things the way we do, it means that one group of people makes high level policy decisions and a different group of people does the care work. And that means that the policymakers are fundamentally ignorant about care in the deep visceral way that comes from doing care. And I just close, I think, by saying that, you know, that title of our book is Part Time for All, and part it has parentheses around it. And the reason for that is that we think that one of the great benefits of this will be time for all that the way we live our lives constantly pressured by time scarcity makes us um, ungenerous. And it makes us feel like we have no time for reflection, for a spiritual life. And that uh, with this deep change in how we organize our life, there will be a vast increase in time uh, and the whole experience of time will not be driven by this kind of clockwork mentality of the post-industrial paid labor force. Um, and it will lead to uh, a much calmer, more reflective, more generous society. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. First of all, thanks for the, um, for the basic income because that's just gonna be our uh, workshop in April. We're gonna try to study that too because it has some limitations on that we think. Before we move on though, I just have a couple of points that I wanted to ask you. First of all, if you think, because, okay, so you said, I mean, or you said, or it was even written that we need to have the transformation, like a, a transformation, because to get to the more appreciative and understanding of care, there has to be some sort of personal transformation, because it can be a bond, for example, that happens with the mother and child, and it happens when you have paternity leave, but it requires that. That was, so that was one of my first points, like how, how can we make people understand on like a personal level. Then there was something about like, who would control? Like if we have norms, right? So 
I, I thought the examples about um, same-sex marriage as opposed to women rights in general is a great example. But then how can we check on people that for doing the care really? Like who would be in charge? That was my second doubt, but we can study it all together. And then the third question, which came up from Sara's question in the chat is, so, okay, so the risk would be that when you were, people end up doing the same amount of work and it's just, I don't know, like less paid or less hours, but you end up doing it anyway. But also, do you think maybe younger people, like there was something about stages in life. So it would require, depending on the stage you're in life, you could maybe do more or less part-time. Do you think that would work in any way? Um, so I want to, so I'll, I'll go backwards there. Uh, I want to treat the um, stages in, in terms of work. So, so in terms of care, I, I want everybody doing it all their whole lives. But in terms of work, I want to treat the, the deviation from a 30 hour maximum. And we actually hope that would come down that as, as economic security increases, that it would be more like 25 hours. But right now we've picked it 30 hours because Tom thinks that in most countries, in most places, so big cities like actually Toronto, New York and Sydney are exceptions. In most places, people uh, could make a living wage on 30 hours a week, but not on 25. But if we over time, we hope that to change. But so the stages that I mentioned in the paper, um, I mean, in the book, are exceptions that we might think new immigrants, uh, workers in their first year of work where they face a steep learning curve and they want to they wanna get up that curve fast, might want to do longer hours. But uh, I, I wouldn't want to encourage any of that. I just want there to be some scope for it, for recognizing. And maybe I haven't thought of all the exceptions. And in case um, some of you haven't had a chance to read it all, we do build in the idea of uh, some people have jobs that have intense periods, which include lawyers. Um, you know, that if you're, on, if you're uh, in a trial, it may be that as long as three months, you're working 40, 50 hours a week. And the, the idea is, okay, that's, has, that's fine. But then when the trial ends, you take, you take the extra time off and turn it into care. Um, Saltando la premessa, è importante capire. So. Uh, okay, so um, shall I go to the who, who's in charge of care, the accountability issue? Right, yeah, who would check? Because like, it would, would it be on, if it's a norm and everybody and you would get social disapproval, that would make sense. But who would actually check on you doing your care? So, so there are two different questions. So I think nobody really, there, there's no state apparatus. There's no, uh, you know, as some of the communist countries have, you know, there's no neighborhood police person who goes around checking that everybody's doing their care. Um, and that's why I mentioned this thing about how powerful norms are. Right. Nobody's checking to see whether the women in the family are taking care of their kids unless it crosses some threshold of neglect and abuse. Right. But the norms are powerful. And so it happens now that the problem may arise in transition. But I think that we what we have to when we do not want to build a shame culture. Um, so we hope that the you know, conversations about norms and being part of a community where everybody is reinforcing one another to try to maintain these norms, that that is what's going to get people to do it, as well as some disapprobation. So, you know, I imagine an example, if you go to a party and somebody says, oh, you know, where do you do your care work? Because I picture the questions changing. Instead of asking, you know, what's your paid work? They ask, where do you do your care work? Um, and you say, oh, you know, I'm a really important scientist. And so I don't do that. I don't have time. And in those contexts, I envision some social disapprobation. People say, really? You know, don't you care about your children? Or, you know, or some. Uh, so, uh, but, but there is another side of accountability that I know that the disability community is concerned about. And that is, what if there's abuse? 
And, and I actually had a, a question from a woman from South Africa who said, you know, there's so much violence by men against women that the reluctance to share care with men may be very significant. So, so there are questions of accountability uh, of what, what if there's a real problem? Not, a, not somebody not doing their share, but somebody abusing. And um, there, again, I think our model has to be what most uh, wealth of societies, how they handle families. That is, we do not supervise unless we have reason from doctors, from teachers, from neighbors to believe that there is abuse happening. And when that happens, there are state authorities you call. And I would picture something like that happening as well as the fact that within the communities of care, everybody is paying attention to each other. And so if there's a problem, people should hear about it. And in fact, I hope this would spill over to a much better uh, responsiveness to other kinds of abuse within families, because that today around the world, people are still reluctant actually to um, intervene or call authorities around violence in the family. Uh, last one, personal bonds. So, you know, there's a kind of chicken and egg problem here, which is that I think, and everyone who does get to have these bonds. So I'm, I'm really in favor of paternity leave and maternity leave that overlap for at least four weeks. Both parents are off because you need to do that. Otherwise you get what we currently have, which is the mom becomes the expert and the dad becomes the helper. And this is not the model I'm after. Um, and I think the only way you can uh, resist that is having both parents heavily involved with an infant. And when those bonds are formed, it's, it's the experience that will form the bonds. The problem is making sure that people get that experience. And there I hope, you know, there's some combination of reading arguments, talking to people, hearing their experiences of bonding. And my own sense, and I'm hoping to hear more over as this conversation evolves, is that more young men are looking with distaste at what long work hours look like, whether it's bouncing from one precarious job to the next or these high level jobs in banking and uh, law, which take you away from your family 50, 60 hours a week. Thank you. Michael, you wanna, you wanna, I made you co-host. So if you wanna share your presentation, you can. And right. you can introduce yourself by yourself. So I don't need to do anything. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor. That was great. Um, all right, I'll share my screen. Sorry, I uh, first set the system preferences. So my name is Michael Walter. Um, I'm currently in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and, sorry, one moment. Share sound. Are you able to share my, can I share, give past the, I'm trying to share my screen, Georgia, but I'm struggling to, Got to work it out. Video settings. You can get started and I can find your presentation and share it. Right, I can send it in the um, link if you like. Yeah, please. Sorry about this. No problem. Okay, here we go. I'll put it into the chat. So, um, my name is Michael Walter. One moment, chat. Okay. Here we go. Uh, sorry. So my name is Michael Walter. It's, uh, I'm talking from Melbourne, Australia, and I'm going to share from my personal experience uh, working in volunteer recruitment and as a volunteer manager, um, particularly with people um, and looking at exploring the type of person who volunteers. Um, so my background, I studied a Bachelor of Teaching and Bachelor of Arts, and I was fortunate during that time to be able to volunteer lots. Um, I was supported by my family, so I lived at home. Um, and so from 15 to 22, I did lots of volunteer with children. 
so on camps and on day day programs and also in the disability sector so i worked part-time uh, with adults with disabilities and children's with disabilities is it working there georgia oh, no. um, and so today i thought i'd reflect on um, my own personal experience to sort of give some grounding in the context of melbourne australia um, and I reflected on uh, sort of the the what were the record what what sort of things people would do. So I'm just going to look up here. Um, and so I, I actually, in preparation for today, I called interviewed a few of my friends who were who volunteer a lot and and who volunteered in the past, and um, just asked them a few questions. And I sort of put them on a, in a, on a matrix of time to give versus no time and skills to give and skills to gain. So in it, um, and, I, and then I charted them on this matrix. Um, so I'm just gonna see if I can, just one moment to sort of organize my settings. So I think I can make it so I can share my screen. Here we are, okay. Share individual, share all sharing options. Mm. That's okay. So as I, I looked at my different friendship groups and I, I'll talk through, I made a few personas because I think sometimes in, when looking at a broad spectrum proposal or something, it's good to have like specific examples that you can draw from. So I spoke with my friend and I'll call her Juliet. Um, she's 30. Her main activity at the moment is looking after her newborn and toddler. Her partner is working full-time and they care the, they share the care and duties, but she's the main caregiver for her family. Her background, she's an engineer who's passionate about social justice in the community. And she really wants to volunteer, but she struggles to find the time and may need to pick up a job to pay the bills. So she mentioned that she would really love to do some meaningful volunteer work as a way to meet other adults in her community. She's recently moved to a new area. They bought a house in one of the outer suburbs of Melbourne. Um, but time just gets eaten up uh, with her care duties. Um, and she loves working with the kids, but she, she, she told me, we had a, had a half an hour conversation today, that she would love to have something else within her week that is social and a place without the kids. Um, and she loved to meet other adults in her community because it even it was interesting on the way she was driving back she had to pick up her car from a suburb far away from where she lived and i said oh it's a bit of a, a boring thing to do you know you, you've you've got to travel you know uh, one hour to get your car registration and she said actually it's been nice because she's been able to sit in the car by herself she's been asked in the waiting room by herself and and just have quiet and not have to answer questions and and um, it was just interesting hearing from her perspective that something that for me would be a really boring activity for her was almost like a bit of respite. And what's that say like uh, about how society that getting your car registered in a, a suburb is a piece of respite? Um, what's that say about the rest of the system? And she says, um, it, actually, there was one, one thing that was interesting. She said, it's become easier to volunteers as our, our Australian government um, has included volunteering as an activity that will subside childcare. So that was one person, that was Juliet. Another person, I, I, and for some of these personas, I sort of I connected them, put together a bit of data points. It's, it's very rudimentary, but um, different people together and use this one. Ah, oh, here we are, great, thank you. It's always interesting trying to uh, act on the spot. So this is the, this is the matrix I was talking about. And I've put, so you can see Juliet's in the top left corner. She has lots of skills to give, but no time. So that was Juliet. The next person is Louise. So Louise is a corporate worker. She's 35. Her main activity is a data scientist. And the context is um, double, income, double income, no kids. They own her, she owns her own house and she and her partner are thinking of starting a family soon. 
She volunteers every Friday night on a van that delivers food to people in the community. So these are actual quotes from, um, the second one's an actual quote. So I can see myself wanting to volunteer next, perhaps in something local, in my local community, my new community. Even better if I could, it could be a common interest for James and I to volunteer together. Uh, realistically, it would be a lower level of commitment, maybe something monthly that would have us meeting neighbors and learning more of the local community. So they have no time, but lots of skill to give. At the moment, no time. So this is another person um, that I've sort of put together based on people I worked with when I was, I used to run an internship program for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and so a lot of this is based on my experience working with some of these students. Robert, hard working student, age 17, school full-time and also working full-time 30 hours a week on top of high school, which is nine to 3.30, Monday to Friday. Um, this person is a primary caregiver and earner in the family as father has a disability um, and is struggling to make ends meet, would like to volunteer to develop soft skills, but has no time. And you can see that Robert fits in the bottom left corner, lots of skills to gain and no time. And so what I, what I found in this space is that the ability, this is something I didn't realize when I was in my late teens and early twenties, when I was volunteering once I thought, oh, everyone should volunteer, but someone like Robert, would love to volunteer, but just does not have the time or capacity because of his duties at home. Um, so the next person, please. Monica, gig worker, uh, age 38, main activity, tour guide, three days, small business intermittent and volunteer one day a week. Uh, they're renting with five friends, loves the freedom of part-time work and volunteers every Thursday as an English tutor with migrants. These are two real quotes from a friend of mine uh, who volunteers. So I enjoy the community and opportunity to meet people outside of my ordinary social sphere. Volunteering helps me to grow and broaden my perspective, working in a way that I feel is meaningful and impactful. I think that volunteering is kind of like a revolutionary act. And if everyone volunteered a little of their time, society would be a very different place. And then I've got two more people. Alfred recently retired and in my, so in my role as a volunteer coordinator, I worked um, in an organization called St. Vincent de Paul Society. And what I found was the majority of the volunteers were people who sat on this side of the spectrum. They had lots of skills to give or, or mainly they had lots of time. So they were on the right hand side of that area. So either lots of university students and high school students who were able to volunteer lots because they were supported by their family or they were retired and had lots of time. So lots of, with volunteering, a lot of the people who have time to give are up to 25 and then you see a drop, massive drop off. Um, perhaps the volunteering goes into supporting the local community. Uh, my brother, he used to volunteer lots um, in the suit van and whatnot. But now he's moved out and he's got a new house with his wife. And I think they will both want to volunteer together and probably local. And eventually if they have children, probably in the school, that's where they'll spend their time. And then the last one, please, Georgia. Jack, art student, um, bottom left. So I've learned so much. This person is 21. They have university 12 hours a week, volunteers two days a week and works one day a week. They're supported by the family, living at home, no rent, um, and volunteers lots. So in this quadrant, in the bottom left, it's, there's, they have lots of time to give, which means that they can volunteer lots, which means they can then gain skills. And so they're at an advantage compared to young people on the other side of the spectrum who don't have time to be able to do volunteer work because they have the time to be able to learn those soft skills. Um, and it's almost, there's a privilege in being able to spend time to volunteer, to be able to learn those soft skills. You don't necessarily learn at school or university, um, definitely through working as, with people with disabilities, you learn so many communication skills and empathy and these sorts of things. Um, but it's an advantage because you have the time, you've been given that time. So I think this sort of 
this sort of model of personas is very rudimentary. This is just through my personal experience and through conversations. And but what it can do is we can say, how would this relate to Louise? And by having a, a name and a face, all those photos are stock images, but it kind of prompts the brain to think more critically and focused on different people. So how would this context work for Juliet, who's got the two, two children, or Robert, who is looking after his dad with a disability, or Monica, who's a bit more free, easy, um, because of the gig working situation there. Um, so thank you for, uh, I hope this has been helpful. I'm finished. Here we go. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened to my computer. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just okay. trying to do that in the meantime. Thank you, Georgia, for um, helping me with the presentation. Uh, no I worries. No, I think it was right. clear. Ooh. I just wanted to show everybody the model because it kind of gives you the type of people and the types of problems that we could come up with when we try to set the norms. Yeah. So and I'm you could ahead. almost place yourself, any, any of us could place ourselves on that spectrum. Exactly. So Francesco, you're muted. I muted okay. you before, sorry. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's start saying that uh, I uh, really uh, consider the most of the considerations and assumptions made by Professor Nadeski uh, really the, the, the key topics speaking about uh, work and care, okay? And mainly, I really uh, believe that without uh, considering care at the same manner of work, uh, we cannot uh, improve uh, uh, the rules and the behaviors of people uh, in relation of these uh, of these uh, matters, uh, but let me focus uh, on uh, the title of uh, this workshop because uh, part time for all uh, uh, from one side is uh, really a provocative solution, but uh, I'm sure that uh, is something that. Uh, uh, goes uh, in, in the right direction. So for sure, it's something interesting in order to understand if we are really able to uh, improve uh, our ability to balance uh, work, uh, work and care. Uh, the question is, uh, part-time for all, is uh, really a feasible solution or not? Is it able to improve well-being and market competitiveness or not? It is able to improve, uh, generally speaking, the sustainability of work or not? Uh, frankly speaking, I don't think so. I don't think that so, for sure, in the near time, in, in the short term, uh, probably also in the long term. Uh, Nevertheless, part-time work uh, is a kind of flexibility that must be uh, promoted, that must be supported uh, by companies, uh, by policymakers, uh, and for sure is something that can really help the balance of uh, work and care. Uh, the contribution that uh, I want to bring uh, to this workshop uh, is uh, uh, primarily the contribution uh, uh, of a manager. I'm the country manager of J Group in Italy. I'm managing more than 2,000 people. Uh, as a, a work agency, we are managing, we, 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 we manage uh, more than uh, 200,000 workers around the world. So uh, at the same time, uh, I have, uh, let me say, the opportunity every day uh, to decide about uh, uh, 
the organization within GA Group, uh, and uh, I have uh, the opportunity uh, as a world service provider uh, uh, to see what's happened uh, in the market. Uh, I want mainly to address uh, with you two uh, points. The first one concern uh, the current context uh, uh, and uh, what we see uh, in the countries uh, where we are working and uh, mainly in, uh, in, uh, in, Reup in, uh, in Europe. Uh, countries where uh, the governments are trying to, to tackle the issue of reducing the working hours and to promote uh, the, the part-time uh, rules uh, with different roles, with different rules, with different uh, ways. Uh, uh, and so it's really interesting to, to see what's happening uh, in, in uh, starting from the experience of the different countries. The second point uh, concern uh, some principles uh, for uh, applying and promoting part-time within a company, because uh, I think that uh, companies uh, are really a key subject in supporting uh, the adoption of part-time uh, because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult to identify uh, uh, a unique solution. It's very difficult to identify a best practice. Uh, and so it's very difficult to find uh, rules that are really able to make a difference in this in this uh, matter, uh, and so uh, companies uh, as uh, have a strong responsibility in uh, in supporting uh, part time. Uh, <clears throat> let's start from from the the context, from the situation of the rules uh, in, uh, in in Europe. Uh, as you know, the reduction of working hours uh, is not new, it's not a new concept. On the contrary, uh, the, the proposal uh, to cut uh, the number of hours every time uh, the unemployment uh, rate increase uh, is uh, quite common. Uh, everybody knows the slogan, uh, work less, uh, work everyone. And everybody knows that uh, is a, a little bit uh, utopic. Uh, in this time, in this period, however, uh, we are witnessing a situation in which unemployment is falling in the most European countries. And nevertheless, uh, the issue of reducing working hours uh, as a return to being topical. Uh, this is due, according to me, uh, to some important changes that are uh, impacting, that are affecting the, the labor market. The first one is uh, uh, the change in the behavior and priorities uh, of young people. Permanent jobs are not or are no more a priority. Uh, of course, it's not uh, the reason is not uh, uh, the, the, the caring of people, probably. But nevertheless, uh, we are facing a situation where people uh, doesn't like to spend the entire life working. Uh, the, th the second change is uh, uh, about technological innovation and uh, its impact in uh, changing the way of working. Uh, and smart working uh, under these lights is becoming uh, uh, really uh, an ordinary way of work uh, in many industries. And so this implies uh, a, a strong growth uh, in uh, flexibility, a strong growth in managing uh, 
the time spent uh, within a company and the time spent uh, at home or uh, uh, in, 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 in other, in other uh, places. Uh, the third one is uh, the demographic change. Population aging uh, and reduction of births uh, are changing uh, people needs uh, and are uh, stressing a lot uh, welfare policies. Okay, so due to these changes, uh, uh, the reduction of uh, the hours of work uh, is uh, becoming uh, day after day something that uh, has a strong impact on uh, the organization of the companies. Uh, and so in, in light of these changes, uh, uh, governments, uh, trade unions, uh, uh, employers, uh, association, uh, are discussing a lot about uh, which about uh, the best solution uh, for for managing uh, these uh, trends and uh, looking at uh, the, the the different rules uh, applied in the different countries uh, as I was saying uh, it's very difficult to understand uh, uh, which is managing the best solution with, with who is uh, uh, able to, to really to make a difference. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if we analyze and uh, if we try to correlate some parameters uh, such as uh, uh, quality of life, uh, unemployment level, uh, minimum maximum number of working hours per week, uh, uh, guaranteed level of flexibility uh, and type of flexibility, uh, average of uh, voluntary and involuntary part-time, it's possible to see that uh, the best results uh, are obtained where uh, the law is able to assure the maximum level of flexibility and the maximum level of freedom in uh, uh, deciding, in selecting which kind of uh, relationship uh, between companies and workers is uh, uh, the best way uh, to support uh, the work-life uh, work balance. And uh, if you see uh, some uh, data uh, about uh, the average of uh, voluntary and voluntary part-time. This is probably uh, the best uh, the best KPI for for uh, analyzing uh, uh, the adoption of part-time. You see that, for example, in in, in Netherlands, uh, where we have this kind of uh, freedom, uh, we have the best results. Uh, the number of involuntary part-timer is uh, less than uh, a third uh, respect to the average uh, in uh, the other European countries. Uh, and uh, the number of uh, voluntary part-times uh, is more or less triple, three times that the, average, the European average. So great results. Anyway, as, as, as I was saying, uh, it's very difficult to identify a, a best practice. So starting to this consideration about the context, uh, I think that uh, it's important to share with you some basic principles that uh, 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 it's important to apply when uh, within a company you have to decide if uh, uh, it's possible uh, to uh, provide uh, to the employees uh, uh, the condition for uh, for uh, for a part time. Uh, I think that these principles, uh, uh, first of all, are, are something that I have uh, personally experimented uh, within my company, and uh, uh, I'm able to 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 see the results in in, in uh, applying this principle. Uh, in G, within J Group, uh, we have uh, uh, an average of part-time uh, higher than the European average. 
and, uh, uh, and this is much more important. Uh, we have a really uh, interesting uh, level of engagement of people. So what uh, I'm going to underline is really, for me, is really something that is able to, to make a difference in adopting uh, part-time. The first principle is about the creation of value. Uh, every time we have to uh, decide for a, for a part time, it's important to, to ask if we are uh, deciding for something that is able to maintain and to create value for the company, for, uh, for the people, and also for all the stakeholders uh, within the company. Uh, if yes, for sure, uh, we can uh, uh, adopt part-time without problem. The second principle is about productivity. Creating value is, is not enough. Uh, our work must also be done efficiently. And uh, only if you are able to assure this uh, efficiency, we can uh, decide for part-time uh, without problem. Otherwise, also because uh, if the company is doing well, the workers are doing well, and uh, uh, thanks to, to the organization, because typically a company is an organization, is a complex organization, it's possible to create the condition uh, to improve flexibility and also to, to, to improve uh, welfare, welfare uh, solutions, uh, welfare condition. The third principle is about uh, fairness. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting challenges uh, is to combine fairness and personalization of working condition. Uh, people needs are different and uh, more than in the past uh, to ensure employees engagement uh, it's really important to meet everyone's needs, but avoiding discriminations. So if we are able to assure this fairness, also the adoption of a large number of part-time is an opportunity for the company and is also an opportunity for, for the people. Uh, so I think that looking at the concept, the solution of part-time for all, uh, if, uh, as I was saying, uh, probably is not uh, a feasible solution, uh, if we are able to apply this principle and to have in mind that working together, uh, we can uh, help each other in uh, defining uh, uh, the right balance uh, between uh, uh, time spent for uh, work and time spent for care, uh, uh, we uh, are really able uh, to, to, to make a uh, great step ahead. So uh, let's try together to work on, on this uh, in this direction. Right. Um, he said something, something that I want to, before I pass on Tarita, so she has another corporate example something that sparked me was the flexibility and freedom. Because I know for me, homeworking meant that I have more freedom. So it's like, I can, maybe I'm, I'm working right now. So I'm doing something else. That's not my job. So from five to six, when I'm meant to be working, but then at the same time, like I can work earlier in the morning, or I can probably read an email at nine. When I realized I had gotten the, the time, daylight savings time wrong I was emailing yesterday at like 11 30 at night I mean it gives me freedom but this doesn't mean that I work 70 hours I take off time inside of my day and that's really flexibility and freedom on the other hand I hear of a lot of people that are overwhelmed by homeworking because then all they do is work because they always find you and then you have all these Zoom calls, like one attached to the other. And so something that we were discussing in the chat is what happens if you don't attend? What happens if you don't do the overtime? Because many times nothing happens, you know? And then something else though he said was the efficiency. So that's, I guess, what worries everyone. Like who defines efficiency though? 
because am I, I can be not efficient even when I'm in the office for 10 hours. Ah, for sure. So, so then we do really need a change. So I don't know, we have to discuss this. I, this, is, this is just me thinking. Rita, you wanna tell us your experience? Yes. You can share your job change because that also made a difference. Uh, can I share my screen? I think so, hold on. No. I don't know how. No, for some reason you I can't make you co-host. Maybe because my system threw me out. Do you want to send me what you want to share? Yes. <laughs> Wait a second. That's why we always need to be prepared. <laughs> Doesn't matter. This is very informal, but uh, wait. Let me share. And and if you can do it, that's fine. If not, I will just speak. No problem. Uh, that's what uh, what I was saying. That's why we always need to be prepared because if technology fails us, <laughs> did you send it to me via email? I, I'm I'm doing it right now. Okay. So. Yeah, so you can start and I'll figure it out. So, hello everyone, I'm Rita, talking to you from Portugal, the north of Portugal, Porto. I have been working for the past 10 years in an energy company called EDP. We're also present in Italy, in the north of Italy. And I have here, let me just open my presentation. So the first a few years uh, at EDP, I worked at a stakeholders um, management department. Uh, and then after a, a very intense and uh, uh, volunteering experience with refugees, uh, I was ready to change uh, company and to change work. But then suddenly my company invited me to manage our corporate volunteering program. And that's what I've been doing for the past uh, four years. So it was lovely to hear Michael talk about skills and time because when we're managing volunteers and volunteering, it's all about that. And I think the topic here today is a lot uh, about time. So I think time here is a pressing, a pressing issue. What I had here to, to share, just first of all, to, to let you know who we are, um, we are a multinational uh, company. We have 40, uh, oh, perfect. We have, thank you, Georgia. <laughs> we have 40 um, years of history. Uh, can I, oh, it, it had, it, can you change to the next slide? Um, no problem, I, I'm, I'm following <laughs> mine, so. That's okay. So we have 40 years of history. We are present in 20 countries in four continents. We are the fourth largest wind energy production company in the world. And almost 66% of our energy is produced from uh, renewable uh, resources. And we have about 11 million customers uh, worldwide. Um, in terms of employees, so you, you can have a, an idea of the size of the company and the, the size of, I mean, and the, the, yeah, the size of our uh, volunteering program regarding the, the total uh, amount of uh, employees. We have about 12,000 uh, 12, employees from 41 nationalities. Um, and we have each year about 20% uh, of these employees volunteering uh, through the company. So uh, our volunteering program and uh, each company has its approach, but for us at EDP, uh, our volunteering uh, program uh, is based on company time. So each person, each employee has four hours per month in company time, so paid company time to volunteer uh, in a pool of projects that we design according to our social investment priorities. But also if you, if you want to engage 
with a personal project or you're already working with your parish or an NGO, you can also activate these four hours uh, for, that, for that matter. So 20%, um, we're talking about uh, 2,400 people each year, and we have about 4,000 people registered in our uh, volunteering platform, which I will leave the link here so you can visit it. Um, and then um, uh, our approach besides uh, giving time is also looking it in a triple perspective. And uh, it's unfortunate that I cannot show you the graphic, but I will um, try to read it for you. So a triple perspective. From the, the perspective of the company, uh, our goal is to work on lasting and transparent partnerships and relationships with our local communities. And so we really want to engage our employees in our social responsibility. We're saying that our people are part of the company's responsibility. And if they want, because the program is voluntary, it is not mandatory. So there are companies where volunteering programs will be more mandatory. They will be outside company time. So just... So, so just the, so you understand the differences. So triple perspective from the company side, then from the community side, which I would say is the, is the basis of our work. Uh, the goal is really to work together with uh, communities in, in, uh, in a perspective that was uh, reinforced in the, in the event last November, when we heard that all solutions to fight inequalities should, design, should be designed with the people that leave those inequalities. So for us as a company, our approach is to work with people in the field, with the NGOs, with the local communities, and really design uh, partnerships uh, that can be fruitful for both sides. Then triple perspective, the third part is people. So people, our employees, but not only our employees, because really we challenge our employees to bring to the volunteering activities, families, friends. We also challenge partners and clients. And so we are really a, an inclusive uh, program. And what I can tell you today, but I think you all know and, and see the, the that it makes a lot of sense is that what we're hearing from our employees is, uh, and, the, and the benchmark all also says this, is that people really value that the company has a volunteering program. People feel pride. Uh, the, I would say almost every uh, one that volunteers with the company would say that they feel pride, more motivated to their, to their jobs. They feel also they have uh, experiences of well-being when volunteering, and we all know that there are scientific studies saying that volunteering has a positive effect in our health. So from the, from the employees and the people side, those are, 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 are important aspects. I also wanted to share uh, that we have uh, five main areas of, of investment, uh, social inclusion, energetic inclusion because of our core business. Then of course, everything related to skills, uh, to climate action and biodiversity. Um, I would like to, start, uh, to reduce my rhythm a little bit just to, to share some thoughts and also when, when listening the, the, the previous uh, interventions. Um, we all know that volunteering across the world is a dynamic force. We're talking about more than 1 billion of volunteers. So that's a lot of people volunteering. We also know that today, the majority of time, uh, of volunteering time is informal. So it is not formal, not managed by a company or an NGO. Uh, in Portugal, we know that uh, one in 10 people are volunteers, which is a, 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 an extremely low, um, engagement. In, in our company uh, in Portugal, two in, uh, out, of, out of 10 people uh, engage with volunteering uh, activities. 
We also did a, a survey, an internal survey uh, a year ago, and we asked people who had done volunteer for the first time through the company. And from 900 respondents, 35% of the people said that the first time they volunteered was through the company. So here we also see this aspect of a company allowing someone to engage with a community or an NGO for the first time. And, and I think this is, uh, this is very impactful. Um, for us as a company, but also for the for the people. And what we see also is that after ac activating hours through the company, a lot of our volunteers engage with their communities in their personal time, and they continue uh, on a long run uh, perspective, uh, volunteering with that uh, with that um, NGO or with that uh, um, community. So today I wanted to bring, I brought some questions and challenges that uh, I am seeing as a, a volunteer manager from a company perspective, but also try to give a personal perspective to this uh, discussion. I think the main issue here is time. So nowadays we can talk about productivity and efficiency, but at what cost? Because if, uh, we are, uh, if we are very um, efficient and we uh, produce a lot, but people do not have time and live lives divided between work and care. So it seems like work, it's work versus care and not work and care. Life's, life seems like the, the shelves of a, of a bookshelf uh, and, uh, and, not, uh, um, and we, we do not look at life in an integral perspective, just the one that Pope Francis is, has been challenging us to, to look. So uh, I would like to share a few questions that I, and challenges that I brought here today. Uh, for example, uh, will more time to care allow more time uh, to engage at a community level and to engage in more volunteering activities? Or will people understand more time to care? They will use some hours to care, but then the other hours, they will use it in a more individualistic way. Because what I see in Portugal, and I think we see all across, across the world, is even if there are a lot of volunteers, not only volunteer work is not as recognized as it could be, but also um, we see more um, people isolated, and technology is not addressing uh, fully inequalities and isolation. So the need for re resilient, stronger and closer communities is, uh, um, is urgent and it's always pressing us. Then another question is, will a new approach to care also benefit the perception uh, that people have regarding volunteering activities? Sometimes we hear in our company, oh, that person volunteers because they don't have a lot of work or they don't work a lot. That's why they volunteer and they use company time. Or even outside company time, sometimes there's the perception, oh, people volunteer just because they want to feel good or be perceived as good people, good, a good person. And so I, I, I also think that as care, volunteering also needs to benefit from a more positive uh, perception because volunteering ultimately gives access to, uh, um, gives people the access to different social realities. And so I believe it also gives them access to care because when they experience volunteering, they touch a dimension of care, of care for the other. And so that can challenge them also at a personal level. Then a, a few aspects regarding corporate volunteering. Corporate volunteering in company time is not possible for everyone and every company. And even in our company where it is possible, unbalanced work schedules don't allow for some people to participate 
in volunteering activities and company time. So what we're seeing is that companies are developing uh, corporate volunteering programs because this is a tendency worldwide. And it's a good tendency because we are going from a philanthropic perspective to a more transformation, transformational perspective. And that's great. But if now we have companies that uh, are so addicted to productivity and efficiency at whatever cost and don't even give um, the conditions for people to use the hours that the company already has as a norm, what's the point of having a corporate volunteering program or what's the point of having uh, uh, specific benefits if people cannot uh, use them? So that, that's a question that I leave here uh, today. And also, as uh, I work at the uh, human resources at um, the, old, the, the holding of, of EDP Group, and so I'm managing uh, the, the, our corporate volunteering program from there. I'm also part of a company that's looking at work-life balance issues and new, new ways of working. And so when we come back from, uh, uh, from this, from, from the from this emergency state, we will probably have the majority of people working two days from home and th three days at the office. And it used to be five days at the office. And so we are, all, as a lot of companies, we are changing the, the models. We are giving more flexibility. But for me, the question persists. So the main question for me is if current well-being strategies and all of these concerns that companies are, are showing, especially after COVID and with COVID, COVID uh, so uh, mental health um, and uh, uh, areas and full areas uh, uh, and groups of people that were always working from the office will now work from, from home. But are these strategies really addressing the pain point of long hours? Uh, do we have data on, are companies really interested in um, uh, understand, analyze, and uh, have data on how people perceive their schedules and long hours? Because I think companies uh, sometimes don't really want to hear everything because the problem persists. And just to, and, and, and starting to, to end my presentation, also a question when, when I was hearing uh, everyone, and, and also from, from the sessions we've been doing here in Portugal regarding uh, integral uh, ecology and a more integral economy. The question is, uh, we've, we've changed from a, an economy or a, um, a market where we had a boss who told us everything. And now people have more flexibility, they work by projects and they have more autonomy. But do we have people in the workforce that really know boundaries and limits? So the, the discussion that was going on here on, on the, this chat because of someone's friend, I think it was Michael's, uh, Michael's friend. Uh, um, because uh, I think that uh, we have a, a difficulty, a, a, a big difficulty in uh, defining limits. And so even if we reduce our schedules, will we uh, be prepared to make tough decisions and to define boundaries and limits and to say, okay, so I, I'm working five hours today and I stop after those five hours. And so my phone, my computer, everything is limited in a in a in that period of time and then my my phone my computer is open to another period of of my day which will be dedicated for example for care activities for volunteering activities which i think also integrate care so i think here we really need to address this this topic of giving people internal tools and time management cannot be only um, focused on technocrat uh, aspects or uh, technology, because it has more to do with people's uh, decisions and uh, people's approach. Sometimes people think, oh, I will lose my job if I don't work 10 hours. Will you really lose your job? Maybe not. So you're opening a precedent 
and giving your company a, a wrong sign and you're just giving a wrong uh, a contribution. I don't know if it's wrong. I, well, I think it's wrong, but maybe people don't see that. Um, a contribution so that the system continues the same. And so I think I, I, would, uh, I would stop here and just leave these uh, this questions. Um, and also uh, a new norm for work and care really needs to um, address time issues and the imbalance uh, in which we are living. I think politicians, companies will only understand if they see the potential the po and the positive impact that can have a new norm of work and care for everyone. Because ultimately people will, will be happier, will be more productive, we will have uh, more resilient and uh, solidarity uh, communities. And so we will be uh, really uh, taking care of our common, common earth. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Rita. Yes, I wanna, I like this idea because I believe like she said that many things are company legends. Things, it's like a social norm. They don't make you do things because you think something is going to happen to you. But really, if you worked less and you, you didn't work your overtime, nothing would happen to you. Maybe you wouldn't climb the social ladder, but it's still a legend. There was also a question um, by Felipe. He was saying if there are actually some pilots for the part-time. And then something that just came to my mind, we obviously focused on volunteering, but, um, but, there's a there must be a big difference on volunteering and the actual care so i don't know where do we draw that line philippe if you want to add something go ahead if i didn't if i didn't mention your questions you're muted though okay i i, I saw that you you are managing my mute uh, i i uh, first of all thanks jennifer i i've just uh, known your work very recently with the of uh, approach and uh, I think it's amazing uh, because in, in just in a phrase, I've, I've been working 10 hours or 12 hours a day in banking uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And some extra hours creating an, a, an NGO and because I felt that was very important for me to do that. So the idea of putting both together in a balanced way is, is, is incredible. My point was, uh, I, I, I'm a member of the board of a, um, a research team, a research center at the Catholic University of, of Lisbon. And we are exactly uh, starting a project uh, uh, related with the, the, the EOF approach to, to these teams and sp especially uh, uh, work and care. And uh, the idea that we have was, why don't we try to, to, to propose and try to put in place a, a pilot project uh, we, in a country or perhaps in three or four European countries where we could choose a, a couple of companies that are sensitive to this approach and they decide at least in a, three or four departments or of, of the company to start doing this approach. Uh, and uh, uh, I came in on the workshop a little bit uh, late, so I didn't hear you from the very beginning, but I, I guess you were underlining that uh, 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 perhaps also for, for the American uh, uh, system where healthcare uh, or, or the uh, is not so strong. So Europe, Europe has some countries like the, the, the wealth, wealth, welfare state in the Nordic countries and also in Portugal, where the basics more or less are there. So why don't we try to do that? And finishing my, my remark, uh, currently the, the Portuguese presidency of the, the European Union uh, is stressed that uh, uh, combining with the uh, new green deal uh, and the, the digital transition that are, are two 
pillars of the, 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 the European Union strategy should be a social one, the, the pillars, uh, the social uh, pillar. So I guess it could be interesting if, if you think about a, on a, pro, on a uh, uh, several countries project uh, like this. So what do you think? Your comments, please. Yeah, you have to unmute yourself, Professor, but yes, I would have. Great. Well, I, I think pilot projects are the, are really important. And uh, that is my next project once I get this book off to the uh, publishers, which I hope will be uh, in the very near future, um, is to, to I, I would, so in North, in Canada, so I'm in Canada where we actually have a functioning healthcare system. But um, although, uh, it goes to show that the U.S. has a terrible healthcare system, but if they really want to get something done, like getting the shots out, they're doing a great job. They can use their money to make it happen. But um, I, I, I think it's important to try to have different look at different kinds of companies. So some of the most the worst offenders are something very close because I work in a, teach at a law school, and the law firms in North America have outrageous. Uh, hours. So I'm hoping to try to find one of these firms that thinks of itself as progressive, but actually has terrible policies and see if I can talk them into a pilot project. The tricky part is that I don't, I don't want it just to be a pilot project of, of good part-time work. This is so I want to just say some of the conversation around here has been appropriately worried about what part-time work because our experience with part-time work is it's bad part-time work. That's what it means. No security, no benefits. It's precarious work. If, so that cannot possibly be what we want. And there is one of the areas where there will probably need some legal intervention in addition to the norms to protect part-time work. Um, so just to finish, I think on the, on the uh, pilot projects, I think this is very important and the more the better but many different kinds of companies. So big law firms, people who are producing things, yes. all, all different kinds to see how it can work. But, but just to finish that thought, what it's important is to get employees who will make commitments to increasing their care. We want both yes. if it's gonna yes. be a real, a real pilot project. Um, yes. So, but just to go back for a moment to uh, thinking about part-time work and ensuring that it's good part-time work. And, and thinking about these recurrent issues of productivity and efficiency. So we do have you know, increasing uh, sort of anecdotal evidence of more than anecdotal, given companies reduce their hours and then find that their productivity increases. So this is good news for us, except that listening to this conversation, and it's not surprising. So these are computer companies, pretty high level, uh, intellectual engagement where you can see that we should all know that you cannot actually work really creatively and productively for eight or nine hours a day. That's just not how our brains work. Everybody knows that. The brain scientists have been telling us this for a long time. So reducing the hours should increase productivity. But what I don't know is whether anybody has studied these examples and they, they are proliferating in terms of the stress of the employees. So because I heard several comments saying, well, what if we reduce hours, but, it's, but the expectations remain the same? That just increases the stress. So that, again, that cannot be what we want. And how you control for that, I think, has to be some combination of norms, changing the culture, um, and laws that, that provide a variety of protections. And I won't go into it, but the whole issue of flexibility is a very complicated one. Our view on this is that uh, this always has to be a collaboration between the workers and management. That's what flexibility has to mean. It can't be mean that it's one-sided, that the management can is flexible about when they want you. We've seen the terrible examples of that in North America, you know, the on-call worker, basically. Um, so the meaning of flexibility is complex and it has to include the role of the workers. Um, but I, I wanted to say that I have a few more specific comments about things that have come up, but 
Uh, and by the way, the, the Netherlands is a great example of successful part-time work at very high levels because lots of people say you can't do it at the management level. You can't. The Netherlands show that you can, but it's incredibly gendered. They, it's 75% of the people who take up the part-time work are women. So this is, this is doing nothing <laughs> for my care policy divide. Not nothing, but way not enough. So it just shows you that you, as you think about recalibrating, you need to keep all of these concerns on the table at the same time, because you can fix some parts and completely miss others. Um, so I want to make a, a suggestion, Georgia, for a future meeting, which would really be on the economics of this. So I thought listening to Francesco really should be, have been my colleague, Tom Mallison, who was here because he's writing the chapters on the feasibility. He's the political economist. My job is to persuade you that this, the normative foundation around care makes sense. But this is an audience that already gets that. Um, so uh, I think part of what is necessary is to have a meeting of economists and political economists and psych psychology economists, you know, and feminist economists to talk about these feasibility issues and to talk about what we mean by measuring productivity, what we mean by efficiency, how that meshes with other human values. And, and I just want to put on the table one of my own questions, which is, well, you know, we see this phrase, we now our economies are driven by profit over people and we want to change that but the people the economists who not necessarily just right-wing economists understand profit as a measurement which allows us to assess the efficiency and productivity and and production of value that's how you know that's how you measure it so if we want to change the normative structure so that it's not profit at all costs, it's not profit over people, we have to think about, well, what will be the measurements, right? If we're, if we're not going to rely on profit in an old fashioned way, what, how do we measure productivity and efficiency in a human related way? And, and that's not a question I could begin to answer, right? This is, we want, we want economy of Francesco economists to talk about that. And so I would, I would love to be a part of the audience <laughs> at such a gathering. And I think my, my colleague Tom would be a great presenter, um, including at the basic income thing, by the way. But so, um, yeah, I think maybe, maybe I should just stop there. But just, just to repeat that um, part-time work has to be good work and figuring out what that's gonna look like uh, while companies make enough money to continue to be there and provide jobs and produce goods and so on is, is a very complex problem. Um, but certainly Tom, and he's persuaded me, thinks that, that the feasibility is not a problem. And I just see one more thing about the transition, which is, so he relies heavily on what France did. So for the middle uh, income people, um, your income never goes down, but instead of your income going up a bit every year, your hours go down. So over the course of 10 years, you reduce to 30 hours without ever seeing an income drop. So what the, the rich people will, as they reduce their hours, actually reduce their income. The poor people will increase their income um, with better economic security. Um, but the middle people, you'll do this kind of transition of trading uh, wages for hours. Okay. Yeah, actually, um, we could have another meeting specifically for part time. But if Tom wants to join the, like, if we want to do the, our basic income meeting with Tom, that could help too. It would just help the work keep going. I'll write to you details so that okay. we can plan around it. Great. Okay. Um, so Francesco's going to understand this. So could we do for the transition? I don't know. Do you think from your experience that a pilot would work? with like an, a reversed tutele crescenti, like so that the part-time can grow, like as professor was saying. So it's like, I start off with certain hours and then they keep reducing, you know, on one side and on one side they increase. So like, because some, something else that worries me is what happens, cause we're talking about high-class people and how this could work. 
But then what happens to people that don't have the education? Like what are, how are they getting paid if they're not doing their care work? So do you think that in a transition period, we could work on slowly reducing part-time instead of just having like, okay, here from tomorrow, you have 30 hours. Could we do like 39 and then 38 and then 37? Do you think that could work? Are you asking me or Francesca? No, I was, I was asking you about what happens to the people that don't have an education, but no, I was asking Francesco about if he thinks we could do a pilot in, in one of our, one of the companies involved. Uh, well, as I was saying, I'm, I think that it's possible to increase part-time. Okay. Uh, but it, in order to support this transition, as I was saying, it's really important to uh, be sure that what we are going to do is able to maintain uh, value creation and productivities and fairness. Uh, of course, uh, is, uh, my view is a simple one, because as uh, Professor Nadeski was saying, uh, Probably, if uh, we if if we look this uh, problem uh, starting from the balance of economic KPIs at system level, uh, everything change. But uh, I'm saying, okay, uh, let's focus uh, on the relationship between companies and workers. Okay, if uh, we uh, speak about this level, I'm saying that it's possible to uh, increase the number of part-times, but under specific conditions. And when I, I speak about uh, uh, value creation and productivity, um, I'm not saying that uh, for, for assuring productivity, for sure, we need to have uh, the same results uh, from people that is going to reduce the time. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that uh, it's important to uh, change the organization. Okay? And it's important to understand which are the conditions for this change. I give you an example. First of all, here in Italy, if tomorrow someone will say, starting from tomorrow, we have to uh, assure part time for all, okay? Which is the first uh, issue to manage? The first one is that it's not possible to find people for assuring the same production because we don't have people able to cover the needs. And the skill mismatch is so high that uh, is really not possible to assure the productivity of companies because we don't find people, okay? Second, also if we are able to assure the same cost, so cutting the number of hours, we are able to assure the same cost less work, but less uh, wages, okay? In terms of organization, is a, a huge change, a huge change, because we must be able to assure the ability in all the processes to synchronize our work, to assess to data, to assess to documents, to uh, let me say, face uh, all the activities in a different way, okay? So this is not easy, but uh, as I was saying, it's possible to, to, to increase the number of part-time. But do you think that it, yeah, go ahead, Professor. So, so I, I think all of that is really interesting, um, but I wonder if you could think, suppose uh, your company um, 
or a retail company picked one subset at, at the fairly high level, at the management level, and said, okay, mm -hmm. this, this group, whatever, however you define it, is going to embark on a 10 year plan of reducing hours and training more people and more job sharing. So I, I do think, you know, I, I don't have exact data for this, but I think right now, when people are sitting at their desks for eight or nine hours a day, they're wasting a lot of time. So there, there will be some productivity just plain from reducing the hours a bit. And, and I think there's lots of small evidence of that. You know, women lawyers who, going back to these examples of, well, people used to, they were working at firms where the norm was you were there for 10 hours a day, but they had children. And they just did not hang out chatting with the other lawyers. They got in there, they did their work, they left at five o'clock and they did their work really well and they were not penalized. Now I'm not saying they were promoted at the same rate, but they were not penalized because they just focused in. And so I think we have lots of, lots of reasons to believe that not super high pressured, but just focused work could reduce hours in the first place. But, but to go back to the idea of a, um, a pilot at the top level where you where you pay attention to all of these issues of, of training, of job sharing, of imagining moving to a high level uh, area of significantly reduced work, aiming to get down to 30 hours a week. Um, because I think it's very important to start at the top in a sense. I mean, ideally you're doing it at all levels, but um, the reason for my insistence on ultimately aiming at part-time for all is that if you don't do that, you will reinstate a new hierarchy. The really important people are the ones who are working full-time at the top, running things, making a lot of money, making the power decisions, and they are the ones not doing the care and remaining ignorant. So we're keeping the care policy divide, we're keeping a priority of certain kinds of work over care. The, I think the only way to fix that is to aim at a norm of part-time for everybody. And one of the things that would uh, assist that is to pick pilot projects at the top that pay attention to the kinds of things that you're talking about. Uh, it's a... It's, uh, uh... Uh, it's it, it, it's an interesting uh, an interesting uh, observation, but uh, I'm not sure to uh, have understand your point uh, uh, because uh, let me say if you if you analyze the job done by high level people, okay, uh, you see that they spend a lot of time in many different activities. And one thing is uh, to balance the different kind of activities in a different manner, okay? For example, in order to invest in uh, training, in order to invest in uh, helping other people, in order to invest in uh, uh, volunteer activities and so on. Another thing is to share roles, duties, and responsibilities. Okay? If I think to my job, I cannot say, okay, within the company, we can manage uh, the same roles, duties, and responsibilities, and responsibilities uh, by cutting my working hours uh, and sharing uh, these working hours uh, with uh, another manager. You can't do that? I can do that. I can, I can uh, invest in uh, uh, moving some responsibility to other people. Okay. But this means that we are going to increase the cost. Okay. But Otherwise, to talk to each other. Sorry. What, what increases the cost? The time that you have to spend communicating to your uh, partners? Uh, of course, the time in communication, but also the time in assuring that we are aligned 
that uh, within the organization, uh, uh, all the processes are working uh, uh, well and, and so on. Okay, so uh, what I'm saying is that uh, when I speak about productivity, I speak also about the ability to do the same jobs in less time. Yeah. Or if it's not possible, okay, to maintain the efficiency of the processes. Okay, these are two different kinds of uh, uh, productivity, but at the end, both this kind of productivity must be assured within a company. Okay, so what I'm saying is that there are some jobs that can be uh, redesigned in order uh, to share working hours with other people. Okay, and if you redesign the processes, the deliverable, the tools, uh, the organization, according to this approach, for sure you can increase the number of part-time. Of course, by assuring the same level of productivity and the same level of value creation. But there are other jobs that cannot be shared. And this job probably can be improved, uh, cutting hours, but not sharing hours with others. Cutting, others, uh, cu cutting hours that can be used for creating other values, for doing other activities. Felipe, did you want to I... Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, well, uh, yes, I, uh, I just jumped in this, this group. And uh, so I start talking uh, with uh, an, uh, a smooth, like an activist that was very happy to, to hear the Jennifer ideas. But uh, giving just very quick background, I, uh, I'm an economist. Uh, and uh, I've, I've done a master's degree on, on uh, uh, development economics, but I, I used to say I'm, I, I'm an economist that I'm uh, sold to, to the managing because I've been working as manager. So I, just to give you an example, I've been the, the CEO of, of Barclays Bank in Angola. So I was country manager for, for them. So I had, and let me just give you also not in, in contradiction, I understand the Francesco uh, dilemma, let's say, let's, let's call it like this. But uh, in my point of view, uh, uh, I really think that, or if we start with, uh, with this type of pilots, and I like very much the idea of Jennifer to start from the top. Uh, and and uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, one, one comment of the the difficulties that we have when we are we are on the uh, on the high level uh, board man, uh, board uh, uh, sanctions, uh, and then present an example on how the pilot projects can help to change uh, a lot of things. So uh, one one of our problems when we are a CEO of a company is really time, and I really like that that uh, Jennifer told, okay, part-time comes uh, under brackets because what we need is really time. And I, I, I had, a, I, I had a, a boss, he, he was a South, South African because I, my, I, 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 I go to, to, to UK through, through Joe Berg and he said, okay, so you are an hard worker. So I, I worked 12 hours a day at that time. Or, so, but you, you have to find out to be a smart worker. Okay, so, and I guess this can, can bring us a lot of tools and I agree with, with Francesco. So some redesign of the, 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 the functions and the job profiles, so on and so forth has to be done. But the idea of having second line people uh, uh, being trained to be prepared, helping the, 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 the top managers and it's, it's, it's uh, very good for, for all. So it's good for the person that has a lot of, of things to do at the same time. So if, if they choose the talented guys that could help them 
And at the same time, for, for, for those, they are having a, a very good uh, training on the job that will prepare them very well for succession. So, so that's, that's uh, my short comment I, I could elaborate later on. Let me give you just the, the, the last example or of something that is, has been done here in Portugal. Uh, uh, the, there is a, a, an association here that is the uh, Catholic Association of uh, uh, Entrepreneurs and Managers. Okay, so I don't know, Uniapac, uh, 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 Rita, what's the name in English? Because it's, it's an association that is everywhere. So th there's an international network of that. But what they have, th they have done here in terms of a pilot was, uh, is not related with, the, with the, the work, it's related with another issue, which is liquidity in the companies. So, you know, uh, the delayed payments that, first of all, the state and the several companies do. So the, the, they, they pay the providers uh, late. Uh, so this creates a problem on the fluency of the liquidity. And if everybody pays late, so uh, the system uh, gets blocked. Uh, so they, they didn't expect expect the the government to to create some rules what they have done was they invite all the companies that were concerned with this problem and that were committed to to change it to sign up a, a, a commitment that they will pay on time okay so this fact brought a lot of companies Paying on time and the the the, the, the liquidity the, the cash flow of the of the companies work better and so uh, instead of blocking and everybody being tighted uh, uh, so this starts helping the fluency of of the the, the economy so I, I'm not saying this is a full uh, um, um, su successful successful uh, project uh, that every, every, every company, but it, it helps a lot. So this is just to make the point that probably start with some pilot projects could help, regardless the fact that because sometimes the state and the rules have to go, have to go after the private initiative that is, is already doing the things right. So that's my, my comments. Thank you. Felipe, we'll keep you in the loop so that we can see if we can actually try a pilot, even with Rita, since you guys are with the Portugal group in general. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would say this, I will take down the notes from the chat and we will share a document. So what, what I was saying is if you haven't sent your email, just send it through. I mean, I have Teodoro, I have uh, Janola's email, so that's not a problem. But um, so about Felipe, Rita sent it to us. And so Victor, the same. So we'll start working on a document and see if we can propose part-time. My, my idea was, and that was again, my doubt is, is if in the transition, we could start with like less hours instead of doing 30, because if everybody said tomorrow you work, I don't know, like 38 hours, maybe everybody would be okay with it instead of 40, I don't know. And then we could slowly move down from there. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just missed something. I had, I had to take no, a No, it's call. okay, Professor. My, my last question. But I, can, I, can I just say one thing really quickly? Yeah, can I just add one thing so yes, you can answer sure. to yeah. we can close up? So yeah, my other doubt was, so what do we do with all the, the care workers though? Because they count their living on that work. That was my last question. Okay, good. So let me answer that first. So uh, what I actually, I was very worried about this in the beginning, even though, you know, a lot of the care workers around the world are, uh, it's not a happy situation, right? People are leaving their own families because of desperate poverty, to go to rich countries to care for, you know, it, this is a terrible system. Um, but that, that is, <laughs> the solutions to that are ending global inequality, which is not something we promised to do here. Um, but in the, in the sh 
shorter term, what I actually think is that what will happen is that the demand for hired labor in the home will go way down because there'll be so much more unpaid care available. But at the same time as we revalue care, we will see that right now, even in the richest countries, um, the publicly funded care for the mentally ill, for the disabled, for the elderly, for the children is so inadequate that those people who have been working under terrible conditions for terrible wages in the homes will have good jobs in the public sector, in publicly funded. So that's actually what I think is that right now we, we have such a massive care deficit all or in all the rich countries. Again, we now see, we see it in the pandemic. We can tell where these failures are because everybody's getting sick there. Um, anyway, so, the, but the other thing I wanted to say, because I think this is so important is that the, the question of whether management jobs can be transformed into high quality, either shared jobs or part-time disaggregated into part-time jobs is absolutely crucial because if that cannot happen in a good efficient way it is a major problem for my vision of everybody working part-time so i think real attention to that question far more than we can possibly do in the book we have you know little bits of it but uh so i'm hoping that we i will be able to my next partnership will be some with some people from my business school um and to try to end but individuals who care about these matters and have these beliefs but i i do want to say that lawyers you ask lawyers anywhere in north america you tell them this story they say oh can't be done and there have actually been two very good books outlining precisely how it can be done and how i mean but law is actually an easy case because it's piecework it's how many files are you carrying you know this is not rocket science but in, it is such a part of their culture that the long hours are intrinsic to the job that they, they believe it, um, despite evidence. So I'm not saying that's true for you, but it is a very widely held view that management positions cannot be, can, high level management positions cannot be converted into job sharing or part time work. And that's something that somebody really needs to turn their minds to because otherwise we'll create this hierarchy that is, will really undermine the main thrust of what we're after. Dominic, you wanna, yeah, sorry, yeah. I was muted, I was talking. You wanna close up? <clears throat> Yeah, I, yeah, well, uh, first of all, thank you, really, really, thank you very much. I listened very eagerly to all these discussion. And I, I think we actually deepened our knowledge on the norm side of these, uh, of this proposal. And as Professor Nadeski said, but also um, Francesco Peroni said, probably we need to deepen a little bit more now also not only, but also on the economic side. I, I mean, I am an economist, so I am particularly interested in that part, but I think that would be great. So if you agree, maybe uh, we could do something like this. Uh, together with Georgia, we will try to gather all the comments that we, we shared uh, today, uh, even uh, the comments in the chat, and try to focus on the most important issues that there ever uh, is today, especially those related to the points we, we cannot uh, fully discuss today. Because I think that the, in the economic part that you mentioned, apart from the, uh, uh, the, the feasibility issue that for sure it's important in terms of, of cost, productivity, and et cetera, that it's for sure an important uh, issue to, uh, to delve into. But, also the all part that you mentioned, you know, the pattern for all, so the all part is important because uh, otherwise I think that uh, if a proposal like that would be not implemented to really to, to the all available eligible uh, people, the risk is to, to repeat something that in, in, especially in continental Europe already happened with insider and outsider, for example, for trade unionism or this kind of uh, work protection, you know, that what, what actually uh, did is to, uh, to produce a, 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 an unfairness between some kind of workers that are hugely protected 
for their salaries, their, you, you know, working hours, and so on and so on and so forth. And other work, work I think of the gig economies or all these, these new work that, that simply, you know, uh, turned out to be substitutes of those parts of, of, of work left uh, <laughs> left behind, but but other workers that were more you know uh, protected. So I think this also this part should be a little bit investigated, and and maybe if we are able to have a further follow up or this discussion uh, to to delve into these issues, uh, I think that would be really really valuable. Not only just for us as a economy of Francesco and our working care group, but potentially I think also for our partners here and all the people interested in in, in pushing this idea uh, forward to, to see if it, it can be actually implemented in uh, in a new economy. So really, uh, really thank you all. Thank you, Georgia, for organizing this really really great. Uh, moment and, and meeting and so uh, I, I will I will leave also because my my care duties also <laughs> so now <laughs> I have five kids that now deserve some attention so uh, so really thank you all uh, enjoy the evening or morning or, or night depending on where, where you are in the world and really uh, really hoping to see you back in the next uh, uh, in the next meeting see you and bye bye Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.